a biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. This is Andrew McLennan. Many Australians don't realise that Papua New Guinea was once a German colony and the German Lutheran Church has done a lot of good in Papua New Guinea over a long period of time. Many Australians also don't realise that the first Australian soldiers to die in World War I was not at Gallipoli but in Papua New Guinea fighting Germans who were in the colony at that time. And it's my great pleasure today to welcome Michael Stoltz, one of the leaders of the Australian Lutheran World Service who continues to work in Papua New Guinea to help the local people. Michael, welcome. Thanks, Andrew. Good to be here. Michael, did you know that Australians died in Papua New Guinea before they died in Gallipoli? No, I did not know that, but I did know that (laughs) they did fight in World War I and World War II in PNG. Yeah, I saw the look on your face when I said that, and I did throw it out there just for your benefit. And yeah, a lot of our audience wouldn't know this, that the first uh, action that Australian troops saw in the First World War before they got to Gallipoli was in a place called Rabaul, which was then the capital of PNG. And there was only a handful of Germans there. But the, to the Germans' credit, they'd actually trained locals to fight in their defence force. So well before Australia ever thought like that, uh, there was a bunch of locals and some German uh, soldiers as well. And sadly, people died on both sides. It was a token battle. And then uh, it became an Australian uh, protectorate for the rest of the war. And then after the uh, World War I was finished, the League of Nations gave it to Australia as an official protectorate, which we had until about 1975, I think it was, when Gough Whitlam gave it back to the locals. But what we want to know, Michael, is what is the Lutheran World Service doing in Papua New Guinea today? We actually work with the Australian government on something called the Church Partnership Program. So in Papua New Guinea, it's been recognised by the Australian government that um, essential services aren't actually getting to people in their communities. Um, and the churches are there. So what they've done is they've partnered with seven mainline churches, one of which is the Lutherans, on a program called the Church Partnership Program, and we basically contract with the Australian government, and then we manage and work in partnership with our partner church in New Guinea, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Papua New Guinea, to provide a range of what we call catalytic capability programs to build capability in a number of different areas around health, uh, education, um, gender inclusivity and, and disability. Uh, a particular problem in New Guinea that's growing at the moment, sorcery accusation related violence, uh, and then um, community resilience, which is related to uh, environmental and building environmental resilience and, and then peace building. Wow. I, just going back, I love this whole concept. So the Australian government is f- effectively funding their aid money through local churches in PNG, knowing that the assistance will reach people. That is such a... I didn't know about this. That's amazing. It's the only place in the world the Australian government does it. And it's actually been considered um, successful. So they're considering to take the model and then um, take it to the Pacific. Because essentially, the Pacific and Papua New Guinea are Christian countries. Um, In New Guinea, they're talking about embedding it in the constitution. And whether it's the Prime Minister or the Ministers of Government or the Heads of Department or the churches, they're all involved in nation building and um, it's seen as a collective. Uh, so the challenge in PNG is, um, you know, it's, it's many tribes and so you don't get uh, the um, unity of purpose that that is needed often to get consistency of direction and you don't get a lot of the money filtering through to the people in need yeah and look i can say it as an outsider and who does not officially work in png the challenge is corruption and so when the australian government traditionally gave money to the png government a lot of that money didn't reach need um i mean there's a joke up there you know that every png politician has real estate in brisbane and cairns and you know, I know you won't say, but I'll say it. So I think this is awesome because you're bypassing a corrupt system and, and Australian aid money is filtering down to real needs. So let's start with health. You said health care. So what sort of health care uh, are you guys providing through the churches? So we don't actually, we're restricted in what we can do in terms of direct services. So we are actually looking at developing our own independent money going through to try and provide health services. But the church... Um, established a lot of the infrastructure in the country in the first place. So the Lutheran Church in PNG has, I think, 86 health clinics wow. uh, in, in regional centres. 
whereas the current strategy with the government is to build big health centres in Ley and and Rabaul and places like that, whereas the uh, in the regions you don't have that reach. So part of what we're um, focusing on is is building the governance and management capability, and so that we can actually be more effective. The actual services themselves, in terms of the payment of the employees, is still paid for by the government. So, um, the it's still a really big challenge in terms of in remote regional areas to get proper health care, and some of the stories are quite heart wrenching in terms of. Um, women in labour trying to get access might take them two days yeah. to get to uh, a health clinic and they may not make it yeah. or their children may not make it. So uh, it's, it's a country that's right on our doorstep. It used to be part of Australia and yet the infant mortality rate is still far too high. Yeah, that's so sad, isn't it? But in a positive, it's so good that you know you guys are there on the ground doing your best. So you, when you say you're helping with governance and management, is that only in the big cities like Leigh and Port Moresby? Or are you doing that in all those little regional health centres as well? No, we work directly with the churches. So yep. the, the churches have their own departments and we are working within, we're building capability within the churches. And and that's partly the way the government ties the money. So they they are looking at um, capability building yep. as the core f- focus of the funding so we have to work within those frameworks yeah so you i guess the dream or the ideal would be that we leave some sort of structure or system in place that even if down the track the australian aid money dries up and the png government takes on the responsibility that there's something there in place that will actually result in outcomes in these areas i think it's wonderful it's actually really encouraging to hear that so what are the other areas you mentioned health what what, what are other areas that the churches focus on so um in terms of um, gender and um, disability, we are very much leading the way in terms of theology. So gender equity theology, in terms of teaching, um, bringing teaching and understanding to the communities as part of the church, and and particularly using the church leaders to stand up against um, sorcery, accusation-related violence, which is very much about using power and the old um, legacy um, systems to try and get your way. Yeah. And so the churches are seen as very effective and the church leaders are in um, standing up and speaking up against this. And everyone knows who's doing it. Everyone knows the community. So it's really about influencing the leaders in each of those communities and and changing the mindset. Yeah. Um, But it is sad that the research is showing it's actually going the wrong way at the moment. It's, 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 it's re-emerging as an issue. So that's one particular focus area that we are working on at the moment. Yeah, wow. That's no good. But going back to the gender stuff, so obviously you're just going back to the um, what the Bible says, that God made man and woman and that we're all created you know, equally, I guess. Yeah, so it's a big issue in PNG because on all the world rankings, PNG's um, at the bottom in terms of gender and there's high... There's um, certainly a lot of gender-based violence. And in my experience, you know, the women leaders um, are the ones that bring much more the community values and um, well-being. And so part of that is educating them, giving them a fair education, and then giving them fair opportunity and developing them into leadership roles. So it's still a sad fact that I think in PNG Parliament there's only one woman. And even within the church... There's very few leaders, but in my own experience, having travelled up there and worked a little bit with them, I can see a new generation of leaders, young women who are very capable. Um, it's just about m- moving them into positions of leadership. Yeah, that must be really satisfying for you guys to be working in that space and, and seeing that empowerment slowly trickle into the culture and I guess seeing hope for the future that there will be some great female leaders in all spheres of uh, life up there in PNG. Yeah, I've actually been invited in July to go and talk to a women's conference in the Southern Highlands, and it all came about because um, the lady who's organising that, she and I serve on the same um, sort of international committee, and so it's it's I'm, I'm doing my preparation work for it. So they've got women that are travelling from all the villages from all around. Might take one or two days to get there. Two thousand delegates, 
and um, I'm speaking in the local language. It's pigeon, <laughs> so uh, my pigeon's a bit rusty. I did grow up in Papua New Guinea, so I know the culture very well. I spent the first 15 years of my life in Papua New Guinea, so I have great affinity to the country. I have a great sense of comfort. It feels like home when I go up there, and um, and I do understand the language, and I can communicate, but to speak for an hour, uh, I'll, I'll need to have my notes. <laughs> well done. Well, I'm I'm tipping that it's going to be very powerful, simple messages you'll be preaching at that uh, women's conference there. Well, what we want to do is just share the stories that we've got globally about women who are empowered and what impacts it's had and just open their eyes to, you know, what has happened. Um, what women can do and what ha- women have done in other contexts. Yeah, that's good, just to inspire them and yep. provide them with role models. Now, what were the other areas that you said that the churches in PNG that are... Well, the, the other one is peace building. So I had, um, as part of this church partnership program, all the leaders get together regularly and I was invited to go up as the Australian en- non-government organisation representative and sit in on these meetings and so all the leaders, the bishops and leaders of the church all got together, all seven of them. And one of the big issues at the moment is peace building. So unfortunately, one of the big narratives we have in Australia about PNG is it's not safe. Um, there are many other narratives about the country, but that seems to be the only one that filters through back to our ears in Australia. Um, it is an issue in some communities, and the church definitely can play a role, and the church leaders can play a role in influencing uh, communities um, in terms of moving them away from uh, old behaviours. And so that's certainly an area of how do we actually do that? How, 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 do, how do the leaders can do that? What kind of things can we do? Yep. Um, so that's a, that's a key focus area in terms of the leaders getting actively involved. And often the stories I've heard of getting involved directly in terms of negotiation with communities. To create peace? Yeah. Just awesome. between tribes. Yeah, awesome. And, and my own experience too in New Guinea is if you're traveling with the church in a church vehicle, um, you'll, be, you, you'll be left untouched. Yeah. Yeah, well, I lived up there for a year too, and I remember even when I was there that, yeah, missionaries had a lot of respect because the local people know that a lot of the hospitals and the schools are actually built by missionaries. And uh, as a foreigner, which you and I both are, we look like foreigners, you're probably more of a local than me. We look like we're business people and we might have a lot of money and, and we could potentially be a target if someone is of a criminal persuasion. But it's amazing how they find out you're a missionary, their tone changes, their behavior changes, and there's a lot of respect and, oh, pasta, pasta, you know. So it's good. But, Michael, I'm, I'm really I'm genuinely inspired by what you guys are doing up there and I'm really happy to hear that this is a model that potentially could spread to the rest of the Pacific, that Australian aid money is actually going through churches to provide assistance and support and, and positive outcomes for these nations. So good. And I want to thank you so much for visiting us today here in the studios at Vision and just sharing a little bit of what the Australian Lutheran World Services are doing up in PNG to help, help the local people. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.